Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hi, this is Michael Waits from Asia Tech Podcast Stories. I'm with Anna Gong. Anna is the CEO and board member of Perks Technologies. Good morning, Anna. How are you? Good morning, Michael. Great. Thank you. So I was saying before we started for real that I was nervous. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because you just seem insanely experienced. Um, <laughs> I mean that. And, you know, there are so many questions I want to ask you, but I really just want to start with, and I can give you my answer, but like, how did you get involved in technology? Because when, when I started, like, you know, it was in high school and I literally remember someone standing in front of my class and saying, Almost like that scene out of The Graduate, right? Plastics. you got to be plastics or something like that. And they just said <laughs> computer programming. You've got to be a computer programming. And it just sounded like the driest possible thing in the world to me. Right. And then here we are. I was going to say 30 years later, but for me, it's more like 40 years. <laughs> but for me, it's more like 40 years later. And um, <laughs> it's not that much, but still. Um, and here we are today. And now, you know, tech are like the rock stars of the world, right? Yeah, exactly. I think it's all timing and also location. Um, right after I graduated, I moved up to San Francisco, and yeah, you know, most of the the colleagues that I worked with at Pricewaterhouse, and back then it was before PwC. Um, right, right, right. And that that actually gives you a a good <laughs> idea of how old I am too. <laughs> Not, when not, you say all these names like Coopers and Library, Coopers and, and Library, right? the Big what? Seven, yeah. the Big Six. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. So um, most of uh, my colleagues actually went into functional management consulting. And then because we're based in San Francisco, I had um, directives to go into technical consulting, which is mostly implementation projects on large scale applications like SAP. Right. right. So that's how my career started in the tech world immediately after college, wow. even though I graduated with an econ degree. So and did I. so, yeah, <laughs> so it's purely by accident and and during that time it's tech boom right so in san francisco you're just kind of like drawn into all of the startups and and um the craziness of the dot com um parties and um recruitment and talent acquisition so everybody was so inundated with opportunities and so you get distracted quite easily yeah it's interesting i feel badly right because i while that was going on i was living in tokyo and i was immersed in finance right which in mm -hmm. retrospect so boring um, <laughs> I don't even know why they made movies about it, to be fair. Um, but, but it must have been amazing. Like you just get sucked into this environment and particularly in San Francisco, right? I mean, in the old days, you would have been in Boston, right? On Route 128 with there. I think that's where EMC was founded and Lotus was founded. Yeah. But if you're in San Francisco, you're literally at the epicenter of what's happening. And sure, in 2000, and, you know, 2001, go back to 1999, it was a massive boom, but then a massive bust. But you just stuck it out, right? Yeah, exactly. And and the experience of the, the highs and lows was just amazing because you've seen so many failures. I mean, I, this is my fifth startup experience and first in Asia uh, with Perks. Uh, but in terms of the four companies pri prior to Perks, the four startups in the Bay Area, Three of them fail and probably fail quite miserably. Um, and then one of them went. <laughs> Does anybody uh, fail nicely? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, you, you kind of just say F you, you know, you go on a high and then you said, let's start over. <laughs> Fair enough. There's lots of resilient founders uh, out there. And, you know, I, I started in a couple of companies where I was either the fourth employee or maybe the 10th employee for the first couple of startups. And you just, you know, sink your teeth in it and you wear so many hats. And as a, you know, early 20s to mid 20s, you, you have no idea what's up or down. And so you're just kind of finding your way. So you learn pretty quickly on what to do or what not to do. But during that time, it was so much fun because your growth trajectory as, as a personal development and professionally uh, as well, it just exponentially uh, multiplies during that time. Right. I mean, I just, I just, you know, during my research, I look at what you've been involved in and it's just amazing. And you're right. It's, maybe it's that personal growth that's even more important than that professional growth. I don't know. I find that like the things that I lean on today are more... Like what happened to me personally and how can I apply that to my professional life? It just seems so much deeper. Sure, like all the technical stuff that I've learned is super helpful, but I find like who I am really drives what I do more than what I've learned at work. And of course, yeah. my work is way different than yours for sure. 
Yours is <laughs> yours has way more impact and it's way better. Um, and I mean that. That's not me just like blowing smoke around. So what what do you what do you learn after being you know for years in San Francisco? And then what brings you home? I presume you're originally from Singapore. Uh, no, no, actually, a lot okay. of people are mistaken. That. But fair I'm enough. I mean, it's, it's a it's a fair presumption, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, Asian face. Um, but I actually <laughs> was born in China. Uh, I'm okay. from Guangzhou. Even better. And I moved out to, I immigrated to Florida because my maternal grandmother was born in New York. And then I guess after the Cultural Revolution, she moved everyone back. And my parents went with them. And that's how we landed in Florida because all the snowbirds from New York came down. And we um, we needed warmer climate. So for some reason, my family decided to uproot themselves to Florida. <laughs> so I grew up there. Can, and, can, I, can I back up for a second? This is really, yeah. This is actually really really interesting to me so your maternal grandmother your mother's mother left china during the cultural revolution yes and ended up or in after after. Yeah, after the culture yeah yeah i mean for god's sakes like it's what a ridiculously difficult time you know and oh. again i talk about this too because my grandfather left russia when he was seven years old mm -hmm. right so not dissimilar and you just imagine what it must have been like you know we talk a lot about first world problems but yeah you know, it's difficult. I couldn't get into this restaurant or like my car broke down, but I'd think about my grandfather and then fast forward to your grandmother, the same thing. What must it have been like to sort of leave there and end up in Florida? I just can't oh, imagine. Was, uh, yeah. My, my mother was a nurse. My dad was a professor. I mean, they had to start over similar to, you know, the Eastern Europeans who immigrated to the U S you have all these PhD candidates and right, doctors, right. they come over and then they're like janitors or they're right. cooks. Or, and that's exactly what ended up happening with my parents. And um, they evolved and, and worked in my family's um, restaurant business. And, you know, to see such talented people who built their careers in their home country and to come and start over. And you just see, you become so humble, right? And then you feel so indebted to them too. Who, who sacrifices themselves like that anymore? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. Right? Everybody's so entitled. That's my point, right? Is everyone so entitled? How come I don't have this? Where is my thing of that? Whatever it is. And yet, I literally, I look at my grandfather for inspiration all the time. And I think when he was seven, he walked across the continent, got onto a boat, speaking no language, had no language skills and no cultural skills as well, and then made yeah. enough Money, and it's not the money that matters, right? It's just earned enough, like, to get his family, his whole family, out of their country as well. That, to me, is amazing. Yeah, and I didn't speak a word of English, to tell you the truth, when I moved at eight years old to right, eight. Uh, I mean, that's what, Yeah. Wow. And, and I faced a lot of discrimination. Um, you know, I, I had just had to persevere and, and be more resilient. Because during that time, it, it was just not common to see immigrants in, in the U.S. And we endure so much discrimination. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, I've, I mean, I've got so many friends. Obviously, I've been living in Asia for almost 30 years, right? And there was there is a time, and now is actually part of that time, where being Asian is actually super cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you walk into, a, you walk into a, a room in New York, and everyone's like, wow, they must be from China, or maybe they're from Korea, or something like that. And it's just super cool. And yet I have friends that grew up in South Boston who, you know, parents were half Japanese and half American. And let me tell you something, it was not cool. Yeah. I mean, it didn't, it doesn't matter to me, frankly, but back then it just was not cool. And there was a massive amount of, you know, bullying and sort of, it was just highly problematic for them. So I, I understand, I mean, I don't understand it, right? Because I was born in a way and in a place where I didn't have to experience that, but boy, it's hard and no one gets that today really, right? Again, they'll look at you and just think, never had a problem. Right, and, and that's why I, when you try to look at building your company and finding the right DNA, sometimes you know, you're, you're, you're looking for that person with grit, right? And yeah. is there enough grit in their DNA to actually help you grow? Because startups are, are not easy experiences. You, you have to have the resiliency to endure all of the highs and lows. And when the lows are, are coming, it's really low. <laughs> so there are times where I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to make payroll. And then you have to endure that you don't affect the employees and you take, you literally go through months of your own sacrifice and not getting paid. And so you just have to, you know, be, be the, um, the captain of the ship, right? So you, you can't let them know that the company is actually not doing well. 
And uh, lo and behold, I mean, we, we turned around, but you know, th- during certain tough times, you just have to, you know, fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, this, that word resilience, right. And resiliency is really important. And again, you know, you, you now find yourself in an industry where it's cool to be like a startup founder, right? And people like to talk about their funding and their growth. And it's also cool to be a startup founder in Asia. But the reality is that like every day is a slog. And it's really, I think it's way harder than most people sort of imagine. And, and I agree with you. Like when I try to, <clears throat> when I find people that I want to work with, I want to work with people that have not always had some kind of privilege, but that have had to fight through something because I want to understand when they're going to give up. Yeah. I really do. Exactly. I want to understand deeply, like, what is it going to take for them to, un- for them to realize that every day is no individual day is fatal until it is. And mm-hmm. if it's not, how do we get through it? And I'll tell you this too. One of the happiest moments in my life came this year when I helped, a- helped a company get funded. And I realized that it wasn't just for the founders. I mean, it wasn't the only realization of this, but there was, they posted a photo of 40 employees who would have likely lost their jobs if we didn't fund the company, right? And that's 40 mm-hmm. families. That's mm-hmm. a lot of people. Right. Right. So exactly. Your, so your responsibility when you were talking about making payroll and just making sure that all your employees and, and their families are taken care of, right? It's like what your grandfather tells you when you get married. You're not marrying one person. You're marrying an entire family. It's exactly. It's the same thing. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. And and I totally agree. And so that's why you think employees first. Everything comes before you. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I won't even ask you, but I mean, I haven't had a salary in six years, so I don't worry. I don't worry. You're you're actually in a much better place than me. (laughs) Yeah, fair fair enough. (laughs) We can can compare on the misery scale, like (laughs) who's outperforming whom. Yeah. So when you, when did you move to Singapore? Uh, 2009. And I moved over um, with one of the successful startups that was acquired by CA Technologies, Computer oh. Associates uh, oh, in the right. past. And that was Wiley Technology. And Wiley actually got acquired in 2006. And then 2009, they asked me to come out to Asia because um, I was one of the first team members who helped build Asia business out of San Francisco. And then when they were acquired uh, or the new team took it over, Um, they didn't see much growth. And so they said, can you come back and help us um, fix this business or help us grow? And I moved over in 2009. And then six months later, they said, we need, we have a bigger problem in Japan (laughs) and come and fix it. So I moved to Japan for a year and a half and, um, you know, grew the business year over year, 220%. And I moved back to Singapore in about 2011, I say. Yeah. And right before the earthquake, uh, I was very lucky. Where, you, um, where, and did, where did you live in Tokyo? A Rapangi. <laughs> Actually, uh, Oakwood, uh, Midtown. Wow, you lived in wow, Midtown. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I was, uh, I was given the privilege to live uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> where were you? Believe me, you've earned it. Um, where were the CA offices? Uh, in uh, Shinjuku. And then I think we moved to Rapangi Hills. Oh, nice. I worked in Rapungi Hills as well. It's a great area. Oh, love that area. Yeah, really nice. As a matter of fact, I'm there now. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> well, I'm, in, I'm in Minami Azebu, but close enough. I'll be in Rapungi later today for lunch and stuff. Right. Um, but I digress. Anyway, so you stayed with CA until, and then you moved to, you moved to Singapore with them. And had you, li- yeah. had you lived in, had you personally, like as an adult, lived in Asia before that? No, I I didn't know what the hell was happening. But see, now, <laughs> I mean, now t- I would, yeah. sorry, tell me and tell me I'm wrong with this, but I love this too. So now you have the reverse problem. <laughs> exactly, reverse simulation. <laughs> you do though, because now everyone looks at you and has an expectation. Oh, she gets it, right? Right, right, yeah. Well, even after moving to Japan, they right. they told my U.S. execs, you know, what on earth are you doing to send a Chinese female to Japan to run her business? Like, are you effing kidding me this is going to set her up for failure right in the male dominated economy so right. um, but it worked out really well because uh, you know I, I think it's really who you are right you come across um, not looking submissive or um, as another um, Asian female um, I would say manager I came in as, as an American right so when I speak they can 
tell that I'm an American. And when I do business with them, my tactics and my style is very American. And so they actually appreciated that and they treated me like just anybody. And so that's why the efficiency, I said, business is business. I, I sometimes find cultural excuses, a, a massive one, a massive excuse around why people fail or succeed. You know, I, I really enjoyed uh, Jack Welch's um, explanation about, you know, global business is business. It's not about culture, uh, but you do have to localize your solutions and localize, um, you know, certain dealings. But in, in terms of business across borders, when you do a deal, it's the same way. <laughs> so um, I, I really enjoy my time in Japan. And so I defied everyone's uh, predictions um, and we succeeded. Yeah, it seems to be a life theme, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing. So how did you get involved again when you were in Singapore back in the startup world? Uh, how did I get back into the startup world? And right. first well, because... You have this incredible experience dealing with very large enterprises, and I presume a lot of that is in sales and deal making, and just that you know, as you said, you've had super success increasing sales, not just in the fifteen to twenty percent, in the two hundred to three hundred percent range, right? It seems like every time you touch a sales project, it explodes, right? And on the enterprise side, that's hard. That's really hard work, I think. Yeah. It's really hard. I know you're you're seeing most companies who, I mean, take away some of their acquisitions and the new startups that they're acquiring. But the typical companies, the large <clears throat> top ten tech companies, they're growing at sub five percent year over year. Right. right? And so uh, optically, they're growing now at forty percent in cloud business or sixty percent because of all the acquisitions. So it is tough uh, growing an enterprise uh, business. And I would say my whole what, what drives me is really um, disruption, right? Disruptive technology. And when you're a maverick within a large company and try to move needles, and um, hmm. it, it just doesn't really work as well. And because you, you have so much legacy and infrastructure uh, and processes, it just bogs you down, too much red tape. So if you're trying to move very quickly, um, you know, that's why I... I enjoy going back to a startup because we move so fast and there is no red tape and, and we execute, you know, within seconds. And so I, I enjoy that kind of speed uh, of execution and also speed of innovation. Right. It's, it's really interesting for me, right? So I worked at Goldman Sachs for a few years, for like six or seven years. And you would think that at a company with that reputation that things would move really quickly as well. And yet all of these big companies, whether it's in finance or in tech, they do have legacy systems, and it's hard to explain externally how hard it is because there's an entire infrastructure built around supporting them, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so that's why there's 100 resources to help you do one thing. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but there's not even one, two resources to help you do another thing, and that's the hardest part, right? And you can look at right. all the disruption that's taking place globally right now. And it's really a lot of people just saying, I don't want to exist inside of a large organization because I can't get what I need to get done, not even what I want to get done, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how did you um, how did you find Perks? So Perks was not really my original company. I was brought in as a professional CEO to help grow the company. Um, however, when I came in, it was a very different situation. Um, you know, I quickly realized that the B2C app business or model wasn't going to scale. And, and the founders actually did a really good job at pioneering the whole uh, mobile loyalty space. And many companies you know, came in copy and follow suit, and a lot of them also failed um, over the last two, three years. And so most of them are gone. And I realized that there was a much bigger problem that we could help solve, which is the enterprise space. Um, there's a huge um, dis uh, discrepancy in terms of how large um, B2C companies like the banks, insurance, telcos, and, and retailing, that they have an issue with building relationships with their consumers. I mean, uh, the only proactive engagement we ever get from our service providers is just an email to remind us to pay our bill, right? Right. And the fact that by the time you reach out to them, it's negative. So we're trying to solve this whole uh, engagement model. And, you know, in the new digital era, how do you build relationships with your consumers? And that's what the space that we're actually evolved in. So I kind of refounded or pivoted the company 
to a B2B space and really finding our, our footprint in the large enterprise space because they actually have uh, an urgency to reinvent themselves or to quickly innovate. And so there's a lot of these new digital transformation teams, uh, mobile teams that are actually building new business models. And those are the teams that we're actually helping to um, disrupt it or, or maybe even to solve their big problems. And they're not even really highly integrated with their core banking or core telco because that, that's just really keeping the lights on. But if you're now going lifestyle first, which most of these companies are trying to, because they want data, they want more and more data around their consumers. And so they have to build something that will entice them to come in. I mean, every app that you open, you know, in the past, like banking is just forces you to sign in and it just does one or two things, fund transfer, pay bills and, and look up accounts. But now they want you to go in and look at, you know, holidays and deals and rewards and a lifestyle, health and wellness, you know, insurance companies are trying to get to that space as well. And so we're seeing so much change because core banking, core insurance, core telco is really growing at sub, you know, 10% and it's being disrupted by startups left and right. So they will have to move a lot quicker. So they're innovating a lot faster. That's why you see all of these companies with innovation labs. Right. It's not even funny. They're coming out faster than startups, actually. <laughs> Every company has an innovation lab. I don't know what the hell they're innovating. <laughs> they're, well, I'll, I'll tell you what they're innovating. They're innovating <laughs> labs, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Optically, it looks really cool, right? They have a co-working space that they're occupying, and it looks great. <laughs> but I'm, I'm convinced, actually, and I, this, I'm exaggerating to make a point, right? But I'm convinced that nothing good not nothing good, but nothing innovative will come out of these labs for the reasons that you've said and that I agreed with. And that is, if you're sitting inside of a large insurance company, a large telco, and we can talk about telcos forever because I have a view there as well, and yeah. just large finance companies, right? And large banks, as you mentioned, to innovate inside there, like you know, the, like you said, there are 100 people making sure that one thing is okay. The, the problem for that 100 people is, let's say that something is written in um in c sharp so they're on the dot net and they're using c sharp as their front end and sure they're using java as, as the back end right but now they mm -hmm. want to build an app or, or some kind of new application the thing is if they've been working on that infrastructure whatever it is for five or so years it's kind of all they know right and you cannot take the like the best lady or the best guy out of that out of that position and then put them into a startup situation necessarily and have them excel internally now you could take them out of that business completely but mm -hmm. just the the pressure on them to keep the day-to-day -day business running as you said to keep the lights on is so strong that yeah. they kind of don't have the resources and haven't allocated the resources to innovate so if you even if you open an innovation lab it's not staffed with people that are ready to innovate. And the major company is more worried about, you know, my bonus is based on what, what happens this year. Mm -hmm. Not what I do, not, not for me to develop growth for the next three to five or five to 15 years mm -hmm. out. So the management is, has an incentive to get stuff done right now that's going to generate revenue today. And innovation, as you know, takes time. Exactly. But, but I've got another question for you. And and you said this earlier, but I really wanted to follow up on it. You said you pivoted from B to C, right? So from big businesses to individual consumers to B to B. What is wrong in the B to C space? And I don't disagree with you. I just want your perspective. But what is wrong in the B to C space that made you pivot to B to B? Well, if you're developing another lifestyle app, uh, that's not really going to work because how many users will actually download the consumers are so fickle these days and and they are spoiled with choice right so mm -hmm. why would they even use you so it's not a sticky model it's a really hard model to maintain so what is sticky today that you cannot live without every day as a consumer or as a citizen it's banking government you know, telco services and insurance. That's like part of your daily lives and maybe transit, right? And so these are th things that are so sticky. So we thought, okay, if that's sticky already, I must download my banking app. I must have some insurance. Um, I must, you know, leverage my telco provider for my mobile um, capability. So a lot of that is evolving around, okay, what can consumers live without and cannot? Well, I can live without another lifestyle app but I can't live without my banking app. Right. So 
So that's where we were thinking about transitioning. Well, if that's the case and banks are innovating and they're trying to move into the fintech space and then insurance are in, moving into insure, insure tech, how do we help them engage customers, build more um, retention? And I, I always say loyalty is dead, you know? So how do you build uh, moments of viral spending or engagement? with millennials or your next generation because yes your existing generation that's been keeping your lights on and feeding the the bill um they're not the ones that you want to really build a loyalty with it's the millennials right so um we're really looking at how do we help you future proof your business versus the, you know help you save costs with your existing problems yeah. Everything that we do is revenue impactful. And so what you've done is kind of flip the model around, it sounds like, as opposed to your direct customers being me, your direct mm -hmm. customers actually end up being the big enterprises. Is that is that a fair yeah. characterization? And, what, and that fits in perfectly, if you don't mind me saying, to what you know how to do ridiculously well, no? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> all the startups that you worked with had served the enterprise and you know, we, we, that was the sweet spot. I think once you, let's say, acquire 10 of the top logos around the world or even regionally, right, the tier one brands, everybody follows suit. You've already found the product market fit. You've already found sustainability. And then now you want to now expand to the SME market or mid market. It's much easier that way. And so our model was, mm -hmm. Maybe it's just my training and, and what I know from Silicon Valley. Uh, a lot of companies start out, you know, like zero, right? Zero is mm -hmm. extremely successful, and they went after the SME model, and they, they are solving a different problem. And for our business model, we're solving another problem that, um, you know, in terms of marketing and engagement technology, it's just something that didn't exist in Asia. Um, mm -hmm. And we're competing against the global players, uh, and, and they're not really focusing on, you know, Asia, per se, 90% of the revenue comes from Europe and, and US and Japan. So why would they even look at Asia? Yeah, I mean, for those of us that live here, it feels like a massive opportunity, right? Even from the investment side, when I talk to venture capitalists in the United States, they say things like, I don't have enough visibility in Asia to make an investment. And I think what's going to end up happening, not just on the investment side, but on the company um, development side as well, is that they're going to wake up one day and it's going to look like a thousand overnight successes. Right. right. They're going to say, oh, my gosh, Perks, they must have just been founded in 2016 or 17 because now it's really successful, right? And yet right. it's been going since 2012. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So when you I'm, – I'm really interested in, in the difficulties here. When you came in, what, what year did you say you came in? Because the company's been around for a little bit of time, yeah, already. Yeah, so the app business has been around since you said 2012. Was it that uh, yeah, I came at the end of uh, 2014, so I've been around almost three years now. Now, what was it like internally for you coming in, right? Um, you'd always dealt with enterprises. It was a B2C company. What was it like or how hard was it for you to sort of convince the people that were already there, again, a slight legacy problem, not like it, it would be at a big company, and convince them and say, we've, we've dedicated ourselves to sort of trying to get people to download the app and then to interact with local SMEs to get their perks, right? Mm -hmm. how, how, what was it like to convince them and say, what we really want to do is go to where the users already are and provide them with the perks or provide them with the benefits of our service and say, we now need to sell to you know, UOB? Yeah, it, it was very difficult because you're not only solving the user side of the, the coin, but you're also trying to uh, acquire as many merchants onto the app, building a marketplace. And it's a it's a burn rate, right? So it's a burn model. It's a race to the bottom model. Any B two C businesses is really a race to the bottom. Um, I don't know any B two C businesses that are profitable um, as of yet for the first few years. Um, so if you're really looking at you know building a sustainable business and providing that whole cash flow positive model. I, I think for me is again going back to what I'm familiar with. So when I learned this business on the the B to B to C side, I I actually trip <laughs> trip over myself a few times, and I made some mistakes and hired the wrong people um, <laughs> because I didn't really have 
experience in that space. The B2C space was very new to me. The digital space was very new to me because I was large apps. I was infrastructure. I was, you know, on the back end because in the 90s and 2000s, we were really just trying to move large enterprises into virtualization, cloud, automation, big data, all that stuff. And now it's mature. So there's no more upselling that's getting flat growth. And so what else can we do? You have right. to move to the front line, which is the whole digital transformation side from the consumer space. Exactly. So we, yeah, I, I wanted my, a challenge for myself as well. And it was it's a damn hard challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I made some mistakes, definitely. And you kind of quickly pick yourself back up and, and just be as humble as you can. So I try to hire also... Um, a, a more established team. And now we have a, a few SAP folks, ex Oracle folks working with us. And it, it's, it's quite refreshing now to see that a similar experience in your team. And, you know, Ramco, also our, our head of marketing is from Ramco, another SaaS company. So mm. um, they understand how to grow companies because they, you know, what my head of sales was with SAP when they were like, 3,000 globally. Massive, now, how many right. people does SAP have? It's right? massive, right? Yeah, it's massive. So he, he knew when he grew the Asia business, they, they had nothing, no resources. People had to fly out from Germany to help them. And so it's, it's a very uh, similar uh, experience for him now. And, and he loves a new challenge, you know, in the digital space. I think a lot of these traditional software players or, you know, season execs are looking at coming to the side of the world because they're seeing very, um, I, I would say, mature markets that are not really exciting them anymore. Right. I mean, two things have changed secularly, right? The first is they don't want to work at a big company anymore because, you know, whether it's SAP or Oracle, if they're not growing by acquisition, then they're just trying to split up an existing pie as opposed to split up a pie that's growing faster than they can eat at it, which is kind of exactly. what you're trying to do. And second mm -hmm. of all, like you said, if you want to get something done, it's just so hard, no matter how good or how powerful you are inside of, you know, insert name of company, it still takes way more time than it does if you're sitting around a board meeting, right? And Anna mm -hmm. says, okay, we need to enter this market or we need to get a sales team into this company. They'll go, okay, I'll do that tomorrow. Yeah. It's just such a different environment. And, and I think regardless of age, even if you've been in a company for 20 years, if you just have any pride... Right, you really just want to do something big, and and frankly, you want to do it in an environment that's fun as well. I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what's the what's the difference between, you know, working in San Francisco in an enterprise sales company and working at a small company, a smaller company, right, in Singapore? It's got to be just as hard as it is. It's got to be way more fun and way more rewarding at the end of the day. And I think that plays into all of your strengths, but it also plays into hiring the, all the best people. No. Oh yes, it's, it's night and day. It's so different. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can. There's so much talent, and, and the and the DNA and the talent pool is very different. And obviously, in the Bay Area, and, and in the U.S. Here, um, I mean, acquiring talent, engineering, and sales is just so hard because if you're used to working in the top ten MNCs, and all of a sudden I'm trying to recruit you over, and you're like, mm, uh, I'm very comfortable making my three hundred thousand dollars a year, <laughs> which we can't afford, right? But it's it's more of a a rewarding experience, high risk, high rewards. Um, and do you have the guts and the the bravado to come in and and you know take a chance at a new opportunity? And many people actually shy away from it. They, they are risk averse. So for me, it's much harder to acquire talent uh, for a B2B startup. B2C would be very easy because you can hire anybody and, and, right. and you know, they, they can get the model quickly. You know, how long would it take to understand a utility app or, you know, a, a B2C e-commerce app? And so I think, um, you know, for us, it's so hard because we need that really seasoned experience, the complex sales cycle, the training, um, account mapping, all of that, you know, and negotiation, right? If, if you come from a very green environment, then it's really hard to train you up. It is actually really hard. And again, I find this interesting too. You said, you know, leave your $300,000 a year job. I, I bet if you ask most people if they're happy at work, they'll tell you no. Right. But they're willing to... But they're willing to <laughs> sell their soul... <laughs> yeah. This is just this is just Michael's philosophy in the morning. <laughs> but but I I strongly believe that if 
There's a way to convince somebody that if you don't sell your soul for money today, you'll be so much happier later in life because you'll wake up one day and you'll be 60 years old and you'll just think, what have I done? Mm -hmm. And and I think it's, frankly, it's a, it's a great trade. And I think it's relatively easy, actually, if you convince somebody early enough, like do something with purpose. And I, I, I actually feel like I meet a lot of, and I'll say kids, and I don't mean that pejoratively, right? But I meet a lot of people between, let's say, 25 and 35. And they're actually searching for something to do with purpose. Yeah. Right. And I think that matters to people. And again, having purpose doesn't necessarily mean, you know, saving a seal somewhere. And although there's nothing wrong with that, and I, I, again, I don't say that um, poorly as well, but I think they want to be able to have influence. And what you're doing, right, if you work at Perks, the, everything you do has impact. Otherwise, you're not doing a good job. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that, so you made a very good point that the word purpose is so uh, important for us because many people just want to come in. And this is some of the mistakes that I've made, right, by hiring employees. I didn't know that they were just looking for a job. Right. And they, they didn't have a purpose of helping us build a great company, but they just wanted a job. And they wanted to come and just learn. Well, I, a startup sounds so fun and sexy, and I just want to learn. Well, but you came here for a reason, right? <laughs> so, what was that so, reason? Right. And so we we really needed everyone to run at the same speed. And if one bad apple infects the team, then we end up taking one step forward, two steps back. And that, that's been you know, some of the challenges that I face. And now, you know, looking at hiring, we, we have to go with this more seasoned people. And that's why, you know, talking to the board, talking to our investors saying, you know, it's a different, it's a completely different ball game here. If you're selling to the enterprise, you cannot hire monkeys or junior people to come run in these accounts because they wouldn't know how to manage or, and talk to the CXO. Right. right. And so that's some kind of, um, that's a, a huge shift that we had to make and we replaced 100% of the team when I took it over. Um, and it's still not perfect, but at least, you know, we're getting there and um, we're, we're building momentum and uh, we're establishing ourselves. So do you get, you, do you feel like you get a different response today when you go to, I love the way you said this, the 10 largest logos in the world. <laughs> what a great phrase. I'm going to use that actually from now on. Um, <laughs> but when you go to large enterprises, are you getting a different response now because the sales team is more sort of savvy and more experienced and maybe just, you know, more professional? Absolutely. Uh, I think they can sense it because we anticipate and we know their buying behavior. We understand them so well because we've been selling to the same folks over and over again. Um, they too right. are getting savvier too, right? They get trained to deal with vendors, <laughs> and so um, so we have to one up them and we have to really understand, but also advise them. I think one thing great, and this is why I really love startups. You come in walking in as a startup because you have the you're so proud of your technology, you're so proud of your product solving a big problem, and you come in advising them versus talking about saving costs, talking about me too, talking about features, because then it's game over. You're just another, you know, commoditized product. Right. But if you're coming in feeling so motivated and so um, optimistic and consulting the, the customer, you f they, they take something back and you're helping them actually establish themselves as well uh, as a more relevant player and maybe even, you know, help them with uh, redefining their business model. So that was something that, that really resonated with us. And that's why I love startups. Yeah. Do you find, and I, I think about this a lot, do you find when you go into a large enterprise, you're actually trying to find not the one person, but maybe a group of people who've already identified the fact that something needs to change and, and in your space that they need to work with someone like your team or even build it internally, but they can't do it. Do you try to find out, find that person? And then they can oh. just point to you and say, see, it's not me. Anna's <laughs> saying we have to do this thing. So I'm not, I'm, you may think I'm an idiot, but she's not an idiot. So I must be right kind of thing. Do you find that person? Absolutely. And so this is how we start building our product market fit as well. Right? And we, we start with one person. It could be the CMO or I mean, enterprise sales is very high touch, right? right? We're not we're not selling to developers. We're not a developers tool, right? So then no, it's, no. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a Slack type of model or it's not a new relic model where you actually hit the developer community. But you, this is revenue impactful. Who has the most pressure to deliver? 
someone who heads a P&L or someone who's you know measured on the amount of leads and, and revenue at the end of the day, right, that they bring in. So it's the head of uh, cards or head of sales, head of – so we work with those guys or the MD of a, a group – and it's a very high touch, um, you know, senior management top down approach. So we hit ourselves with those candidates first and really understand what's their biggest pain point. Well, if you want to grow your revenue or um, you want to effectively optimize your marketing spend, then how do you do that? And so we're, we're trying to educate them more so than um, try to displace any of the existing investment. If, if you walk in like you know everything and you're going to, you know, it's a one stop shop, this will solve every problem. That's the wrong approach, and then right. you'll get kicked out faster than anything. Right. But we come in saying, you know what? You've invested millions of dollars into your infrastructure with all of these different marketing cloud solutions, CRMs, automation, and whatnot, and analytics tools. Well, continue, you know, at using them for a purpose. But None of them actually touch the consumers in real time. None of them are solving your real consumer problems. Um, and that's why we're talking to you now. If you want a platform to help you solve sales now and drive revenue and increase spend and then also bring value to your partners in the ecosystem, that's that's really resonates with them. And so I think when you hit that pain point and the person with the most uh, pressure to deliver – that's where we were actually hitting. Rather than the CTO or CIO or the mid-management guys, um, we don't even sell to the back end anymore. Right. I was going to say it's a completely different sales model, right? And I was just thinking I'd love to sit in on a couple of sales meetings just to see people's responses. I'm convinced, right, just based on my own experience, that people need these tools and they cannot get them built internally. I'm just so convinced of this. Right, right. I mean, because they're not <laughs> developed that way. They never... No thought about their consumers the consumers right. the last thing that they thought about they always <laughs> thought about infrastructure first right right and you know compliance risk all of these things now it's okay it's just a another check mark it's another process now go fix my revenue issues right <laughs> and and even more so i think what you're referencing if unless i'm wrong is in the financial world right with all of the pressure on the finance companies whether it's mifid 2 or any of the other um regulations that they have to sort of program against their tech team spend so much time um developing those type that type of back end technology that you're right they don't have time to focus on how am i going to grow the revenue of my customer as opposed to just not get shut down by the regulators Right, exactly. And, you know, I hear banks um, hiring 50 to 100 data scientists, you know, and they're cranking out AI models and all these different tools, but none, right. none of them actually are used in real time. So I said, this is a massively expensive call center. <laughs> <laughs> still, the data that you actually now manipulated and you built around are still in sitting in the infrastructure is not being used in real time. So when are you going to start making money? Right? That's and so everything is very reactive. Um, if you're, that's why I, I feel so passionate about this space. No one has solved the space yet. No, it's really interesting. I was going to ask you who the other competitors were because I followed, like, I don't know how to explain this properly. I, I ran into, I believe, and I could be wrong here, but I was in Singapore once in 2012, and I was sitting in a coffee shop on Club Street one morning. And, you know, I had my laptop open and the guy next to me had his laptop open. And I think if, I, if my memory serves me correctly, that that was Andrew, actually. Uh-huh. Okay. And so <laughs> I think, but again, you know, I'm getting old, so my memory doesn't serve me so well. But, but the whole business is so completely different. And every other competitor that even existed then feels to me like it's gone. And what it means is that whatever you're doing... Right, the switch from B to C to B to B, and like attacking the customers from from their source, right, which is really where they're getting all their services, has to be the right model. I mean, I agree with that implicitly, anyway, right. And we can talk a lot about B to B versus B to C, but I but I agree with this model actually more than B to C. And like you said, if you look at the statistics, um, you know, nobody even downloads a new app anymore. So any just getting someone to download it anew is almost impossible, right? Right. But what's more interesting to me is your use of data, right? We can talk about buzzwords and big data and stuff, but data does matter, yeah? But you're yeah. right. If you if it's sitting in a database somewhere, no matter how much you manipulate it after the fact, unless you're doing this in real time, you're losing a revenue opportunity at some at the point where that data gets created. And I'm really curious on your view there. Yeah, and, and this is the fundamental problem, right? So there's so many, you know, I would say big data 
tools out there, um, Watson's, you have Hadoop and all these different frameworks and, and platforms. And then you have visualization tools like Click and Tableau. They, they do their job really well, but essentially it's still reactive. It's still internally right. focused, right. Right? right? So now what happens if you a marketer or a sales organization runs a campaign and then they realize that this campaign, like after 30 days, didn't really make any money or have any con- conversion? And then they go back to the analysts um, and the, the the BA tools and try to manipulate the data, understand why it failed. I mean, now three months later, you realize, okay, crap, um, we, we could have done it this way. But if you had a real-time solution, you can see the activity live and, and you see that this campaign actually did not drive the, you know, the success or the, the ratio that you wanted. So you can actually quickly pivot or, I mean, and maybe even adjust that campaign. So this is why if you're not using the data in real time, and a lot of them talk themselves out of that because of the compliance and the, the risk and the data privacy, you know, Europe in January in 2018, a lot of the governments are actually forcing these uh, financial institutions and large enterprises to actually expose themselves to open API models and start integrating with third-party solutions. And they're forcing them to the cloud. So, if one continent is doing that, you know, Asia has, we always say Asia is fallen behind in cloud adoption and whatnot. But because it's also uh, one of the, the higher um, smartphone adoption regions, it could move even quicker to the cloud. And Much but I faster. think with the, right, and with the, you know, 700 million plus in Southeast Asia, and most of these are millennials. And they're actually more mobile and digitally savvy than anybody. I think this region has so much potential to disrupt and force their big service providers to act faster. Um, and so we're, we're working with that. We're seeing a transition. I mean, one year ago, when we talked to some of the regional uh, enterprises, they were not ready. And they really had a thousand excuses why they couldn't do it. And now they're just moving fast and faster. And they said, look, we have a different way of actually bypassing this. <laughs> so, um, right. yeah, so they found loopholes in their organization to adopt <laughs> technology. So it's fantastic. Not a big surprise. And right. I think I have a non-traditional view on privacy. And you've mentioned privacy sort of peripherally. But with the concept of every millennial carrying a smartphone, which is really just a supercomputer in their pocket, right, and giving them right. access to data constantly, I really believe that, like privacy is a relatively new, it's a new concept. Just culturally, it's a new concept. You know, new meaning last 100 years, maybe last 70 years, right? Like you don't have the right to know what I'm doing. But if I can give you my birthday or, you know, my weight or how much money I, all these things, I can actually have a better life in return or a better experience in return if I'm willing to give some of that stuff away. And you can disagree with me on, on the privacy thing. but and, and my views on privacy have changed actually quite a bit over the last few years. I think in Asia in particular, with all of the social media and all of the sort of activity that we have in public, that people's lives are getting more public anyway. And people are willing to trade some of that information for for just a better experience. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's inevitable that, I mean, it's already exposed, right? A lot of our information is out there. So there is no privacy. I, I don't even understand why we're so caught up with that. Because the minute you log on to Facebook, LinkedIn, and all these different sources, you're already exposing yourself so much more. And you, the minute you download another app, you log in through Facebook, your data is already exposed. So um, there's so many different ways to acquire information, uh, and you already opted in. Nobody reads T's and C's anymore. You no, know, every time you open no. the, they're not written to be, they're not written to be read anyway, right? So <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you just click agree, and then you you proceed. So I think we underestimate. Um, I think that because the regulation is so uh, well managed, and and there's boundaries. Uh, of policies, I think they're trying to catch up with the big data play and all of the AI play because the more and more these companies need to evolve and evolve quickly, I think government, um, you know, geopolitical policies will actually have to act even quicker. And that's why the companies like Airbnb and Uber are disrupting them and they're fighting these local um, regulations uh, because they're so ahead of the game. 
Yeah, and I mean, so I think that's where you know the startups disrupt the policies and government. Right. I mean, I read a lot about this concept of privacy and information flow, and I think that whatever the established institutions are are making a much bigger deal out of it than the people that they're trying to help, actually, because I don't think those people care necessarily. And yeah, I mean, like, again, going back to, like, zero, right? It's an accounting tool. You have QuickBooks Online. That's an accounting tool. But you're comfortable with putting all of your financial services in the cloud, but you're not comfortable. <laughs> so that's why some of this is just is backwards. It, I, and we challenge a lot of these financial institutions as well. I'm like, you're using third-party tools to do so many different things. Right. So how, you know, by integrating with third-party email you know, push or, or, you know, the EDM providers or the push notifications, they're all in the cloud. And so why are you complaining about privacy now? <laughs> well, look, I can make a really compelling argument that the march towards a, no privacy at all, or the march towards third party services has been happening since the beginning of time. So just bear with right. me for a second, right? Mm -hmm. I have a cow and you have a sheep, right? And I, and I keep that cow behind a fence in my yard. And then I want to trade for your sheep. This is barter, right? Writ large. But then money gets invented, and I say, "Look, um, I'll give you, I'll give you a cow later because it's too young now. But in 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 replacement for that, I'll give you an IOU. So now we've created money. But now I've got to have a place to store my money. Oh shucks, I don't want anyone to know how much money I have. But I want it to be safe, so I put it in a bank. And I'm moving, I'm moving faster than all this stuff really happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then now there's a bank that has all of my assets." They know what I have. So now I've traded because before no one knew how many cows I had, but now the bank knows for sure how much I have. And then if I want to get a loan to build a business, now I've got to get people to recommend me and I've got to get people, a bunch of people that don't know me and don't care about me to know how much money I have. Like it's just a slow burn into everybody knows everything about everybody else. And then, you know, we talk about the blockchain, right? So you put everything on a blockchain, which is actually a public ledger. So where's the yeah. privacy and where do people really care? All people really want at the end of the day is safety and a good life experience. And I think a lot of people are willing to trade like, you know, do you, do you really care if I have $110,000 in the bank or $100,000 in the bank? I don't think anybody really cares. And I think people strongly, they've been doing this forever, right? Humans have been sort of trading that away forever for safety, security, um, <clears throat> and for a better experience. And I don't think it's going to stop now. And the only thing that stops it, sorry for being a little political, but the only thing that stops it is sort of embedded interests and legacy systems. And once you get past that, which is what we've been talking about for the last hour, everything gets to grow naturally. Right, exactly. I totally agree. And this whole blockchain with the cashless society and all of, you know, the movement towards that, it's inevitable. Um, so that's why banks have to move much quicker. And I see their innovation labs <laughs> or hubs <laughs> piloting blockchain right now, uh, designing it in the sandbox and trying to figure out how to use it um, before they get disrupted even more. Right. But by the time they're done, I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> by the time they're done in the innovation lab, you know, there will already be 15 companies in China that have already built it, three in the United States and 10 in Europe. So I, I, I just don't believe that that's the right way to do this, which is why you're doing what you're doing outside of a big organization, right? Right, exactly. You have so much more freedom to to uh, make mistakes and also, also to accomplish some successes, right? And you just sound so happy doing what you're doing. <laughs> um, I'm laughing but crying inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to my world. Yeah. <laughs> Um, look, I have so many other questions for you, but I don't want to take up so much more of your time. I, I hope I hope this has been okay for you, and, and hopefully you'll take some time and come back. There, there's so many other parts of your life that are interesting to me that I think are useful to share, right? I mean, not to get back to the privacy thing, but you know, part of being an entrepreneur is not just waking up every day and going to work. It's all the other things that are around it as well, right? And you're involved in a whole bunch of other things that I guarantee you are helpful to business, but that that's not why you do them. But I'd love to talk about those as well. So hopefully you'll come back. Absolutely. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Anna, really, it was a complete pleasure. I was nervous at the beginning. Hopefully I did okay in the end. <laughs> you made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good. Eventually it all uh, um, actually solved itself out. So it's good. Well, I enjoyed it. I thank really, you. I really appreciate your time, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. 
Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.